The questions before us really range from what, what is, what's the relationship between the church and then the artist historically, um, and then moving to the contemporary value of the arts and the church, always keeping those two things in relationship with one another and what that might look like practically. So that sort of follows straight perhaps out of Adie's poem that was so provocative that she um, read this morning. All right. So I think we're going to start with, well, I know we're going to start with Carl. He's got the mic. And, and Carl is going to explore for us some angles on the historical side between the church and the pastor. So um, I don't have anything specific, so I'm just going to let you freewheel on that. Go. Okay. Yeah. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, good to be here. Um, so yeah, as, as JB's mentioned, I sort of specialized in the early church. And when I say early church, the first and second century. So, and I studied particularly North Africa, Carthage. And that's the era of persecution. And one of the things you realize when the church is being persecuted, there's not a lot of space for creativity. And if you want to create something artistic, there's always the possibility that it will be destroyed which is what happened. So a lot of it's lost. So unfortunately, we, we can't dive as deeply as we would like into what it was like. But some things did remain. And so I thought, let me talk about the things that did remain, because actually, we still do those things today. So there's a running thread from the beginning that binds Christians together in this regard. And there's just two things I want to highlight. And hopefully, with questions, we can explore it a bit more. But you'll find, by the way, it's only at 313 AD when the Edict of Milan was signed and there was no more persecution in the empire that creativity really exploded in the church um, because then you could create things that last a bit longer. But what did they do prior to that? And that's what I want to focus on. And we still do this today, and that is we use symbols. Symbols as a form of identity and symbols of before as a form of teaching. To give you an idea, um, where Christians gathered back then, the catacombs, or maybe an empty hall, wherever they could find a space, what you'll find is there'll be little symbols carved everywhere. For example, the fish symbol, maybe you know the fish symbol, it's still today, which was the ichthus, which was code, by the way, for Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior. Um, there was the shepherd carrying the lamb. You would find that symbol. You would find fishes and loaves. Jonah and the whale was a favorite. Daniel and the lion's den for particular reasons. Here's the thing, though, with these symbols. If you are a believer, then you knew what they meant. So the symbols speaks to the insider. But to the outsider, they had no idea what it meant. It's just a fish. It's just fishes and loaves. And the key to unlocking the symbol is you need an interpreter. You need someone to explain to you the symbol. And then you know what it means. And then you find there's a synergy that happens between the symbol and the interpretation. They enforce one another. So, for example, Daniel in the lion's den. Persecution. We understand that. Um, Jonah, which is death. Three days. Resurrection. Those symbols begin to speak, if I can put it that way. And they enforce one another. And that was one of the keys they used. Um, and so they served as identity markers, meaning, okay, these things highlight for me, this is a Christian community. And funny enough, they're teaching. They, they're actually speaking to the audience that's coming together there the whole time. And we still do that today. So, for example, I'm just sort of giving you two examples how symbols are powerful. And by the way, artists create the symbols. Um, like, for example, a beautiful symbol to me that captures my imagination is the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. It's a symbol of a lamb, often with a slit neck, carrying a flag. It's everywhere. And I know that from the Moravian church, if you ever want to do yourself a favor, go to Hanadendal and see the symbol there and hear the story behind the symbol. Because this is the, it comes from Revelation chapters 4 to 5. There's the interpretation, but it's the idea of the conquering lamb who conquers through loving sacrifice. And that inspired an entire church movement called the Moravian Church, that symbol, to missions and dying for the gospel. And so you find it captures the essence, the identity of that whole church movement, the Agnes Day. My own denomination has a symbol of an open book with a sword above it. 
And to the outsider, that just looks like a sword in a book. Maybe it's Dungeons and Dragons, I don't know. But to the insider, it means thy word above all things, and that God's word is the highest authority and supreme arbitrator of truth. And so you'll find, by the way, if you go into that gathering, that gathering is defined by the Bible. It's the main thing in that gathering. And so the symbol actually enforces the identity of that church. And so you see symbols are very powerful and artists have a role to play in that. Then the second thing I just want to mention, then I'm done, um, is visual arts contextualize the gospel. Or if I can use another word, it touches on that incarnate idea, indigenize it. Um, one thing you'll discover when you look at art in the early churches None of the artistic displays, Jesus and the apostles and the events, they don't look Jewish at all. They look like they come from Sparta or Athens or Rome. And it's because the early Christians who were Gentile, Greco-Roman, as they read the Bible, as they begin to understand it, they contextualized it, they indigenized it, and they started expressing their faith in cultural ways that they understand. And so you'll find that throughout the history of the church is when people grasp the gospel, they begin to express the gospel in a cultural way that people understand. And that's a key marker, by the way, of knowing people have got it. <laughs> they begin to express it culturally in their music, poetry, liturgy, arts. And actually, that's a very good thing because in the history of the church, when the church was persecuted, guess which churches lasted? It's the ones that indigenized it, where it became part of the soil. It's part of their DNA. And so in many ways, as an artist, that's one of the challenges you have, is how can I express my faith in a way that people understand it in our cultural context? And if that makes sense. And in that way, throughout the history of the church, this is what you see over and over and over and over, those two ideas. And maybe binding them all together, the artist has the role of being the interpreter of these artworks. Um, you, and in many ways, your interpretation of your art is the key of helping people see what you're trying to paint. And actually, it's powerful when the two work together. Um, I can just think of one personal example. Has anyone been to the Zeitz Museum outside the v &A? And there was this... Yeah, often when I walk there, if you do not read the inscriptions, it's just, I have no idea what's going on. Um, but there was one specific one, a Zimbabwean artist. And when you read his interpretation of his own art, and then you look at it, there's a dimension and level of understanding and depth to the artwork suddenly. And the two start working beautifully together. And don't underestimate you explaining your own artwork to people. It's powerful when the two work together. That's all I wanted to share. Is, am I on? That, that, that's a mouthful. That's a lot. Thank you. A lot of questions that I think that are sort of percolating from there. I have to find a way to segue from you to Angelique to talk about the contemporary aspect of art. And it, it seems then that uh, the art sort of has a language to communicate the faith I think to some degree to what it is, but also to speak back to the community with, within. So it becomes particularly problematical in some ways, but artists have to take up this role of articulating the faith. Mm -hmm. Is that a good segue to the modern? Can you work with that? Um, I can work with that. Okay, Thank good. you, James. <laughs> um, Yes, so James, I've been asked, as you say, to speak about the contemporary role of art and artists in society and the church. Now, I want to carefully wager, and Coral, you might um, differ from me, but you can do that afterwards. But, <laughs> but I, want to, I want to carefully, carefully wager that maybe in the early church, art and artists helped human beings discover what it means to be Christian. Now perhaps, today, the, the role of art and artists in society and church is to help Christians rediscover what it means to be a human being. Exactly. 
because the church father Irenaeus, that you would probably know much better than I do, once said that the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Or to quote one of my old professors from the Faculty of Theology, Professor Derki Smith, that part of being Christian is to become more human. For it is as humans that God created us, loves us, saves us, and calls us. Now, however, in this day and age, um, I'm not fully convinced that the basic tenets of being human is nece necessarily that obvious. Now, as a pastor serving students every day, I'm acutely aware of this strange new world we live in. One that is driven by many forces that dehumanize, disembody, and reduce us to names on a screen, account information on a bank statement, or a title on a worksheet. And I know there's some students here, so I can also add a student number on a plastic access card. It is a world marked by virtual experiences, by avatars, by likes and reactions, algorithms and watch times, marked by market-driven economies, political polarization, digitization, and the continuous advancement of technology. And it's amidst these realities where we need to navigate what it means to be a Christian. Now, what I find in having pastoral conversations and grappling with these challenges myself is that art, even sometimes pop culture, something the students always find surprising to hear that their pastor, re re their pastor referencing or even encouraging them to indulge in, and can play a pivotal role amidst these forces vying for people's attention to remind them and to call them back into the basic fundamental part of who they, who we are, and that is human. Now I have less than 10 minutes to elaborate on this, but I would nonetheless try to highlight a few ways in which I believe the role of art and the artists are profoundly significant in both the church and society today in the pursuit to become more human. Firstly, the arts help people discover that they are embodied beings that live in time and place. It teaches us that we have bodies because it has to do with materiality, with sound and form and texture and color, with things we can experience with our senses. Artists invite us back into ourselves, into our bodily existence, by calling us to touch and smell and hear and see, to experience again what it means to become, or what it means to be fully alive and calling our attention to what is fundamental to our existence. Um, art also reminds us of our emotions. It reconnects us to ourselves and also, um, also as emotional beings. It conjures up and brings forth joy. And I think especially amidst the crisis of today, it helps us to mourn, to feel more deeply. Through poetry, painting, sculpting, music, and other creative expressions, Artists engage our emotions, allow, allowing us to experience this life, also our life of faith, in a more profound and more personal way. Because, contrary to what um, we might believe, human life and the emotions we live with every day are far more rich and complex than the emoticons on our WhatsApp keyboard. Um, now, I think also one of the central parts of our humanity, of our being, is also our primal yearning for transcendence, our deep pursuit of God. And here again, Coral, I think of Augustine's image of the restless heart. Um, art and the artist continuously break, beckons us to look beyond what is and to yearn for greater, for something greater. It encourages us to explore the boundaries of our existence and to lead us deeper into the mystery of being human as creation of God. 
It also instills in us a deep sense of wonder and a way of looking at the world and ourselves, especially at the ordinary as places where God is present and actively and enigmatically working. Um, and lastly, and I'll end on this point, even though I have a lot more to say, that's why I'm very much sticking to my notes. Um, art calls us to our humanity, not only individually, but through our fundamental human need for connection, for community, and a space for shared stories. Film, literature, and theater, to name but a few genres, remind us of the profound importance of human connection. It shows us that, shows us that real relationships are neither perfect or, perfect or simple, but intricate and rich and complex and asks all of yourself, all of myself, as being fully human to take part of it. It is through characters and narratives that we are called to others, called to ourselves, and I think most profoundly, called to the great narrative and to the great narrator, God's self. In the line, line of the theme of this year's artist gathering, um, I might end with the idea that the contemporary role of art and artists in society and church is to be placed as a mirror reflecting the essence of our humanity, to call us to the beauty of our bodies, to stir our emotions, ignite our desire for the transcendent, to reinforce the significance of our relationships and to nurture our deep desire for beauty and wonder. Through art, we find a profound connection to our own existence and the shared human experience, offering us a glimpse into the depths of what it means to be human. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, you can come, Deb, say notes afterwards. You can come. First one here yeah, can get it. Um, that was great. Thank you, Angelique. Uh, um, so wonderfully uh, complementary um, thoughts there, I think, and, and really helpful. I, I mean, in theology we have a subject area called historical theology, which, which shows you how ideas progress and how ideas um, don't move further away from the scriptures necessarily, but enables us by means of God's word and his revelation to really wrestle with the issues that are, that are in our time. And I think that's it very beautifully came out in those two presentations. Thank you. That was that was a lot of lot of information, and lots to think about. So we're going to freewheel in a moment, and then it's going to become a little bit more interesting. Um, I also want to say before I move over to Mandla's waiting, he's <laughs> pacing, yeah, to get going, yeah, yeah, and Stefan's googling furiously on that side. <laughs> um, uh, one of our mottos at Crux is that it's a statement from Hans Rofmarker, the, the famous church historian, uh, art historian, um, said that Christ did not come to make us Christian, but to make us fully human, thereby the intention of the gospel. So I think um, that speaks to it. I think the humanity in the early church actually beautifully expressed by those artworks in relation to the context of suffering and persecution, and perhaps that's where Christian art will go into the future. We live in very interesting times. But Amanla has been tasked to speak to something of the biblical mandate for an artist based on scripture and also really something of the identity of the artist and, and any supplementary thoughts that come to mind. Yeah, is that a good enough question for you? That is a good enough question He's also for got me. his um, old man glasses on, just uh, the two of us here. Yeah. I'm not going to hear the last <laughs> of that, am I? <laughs> So I, I love that statement that you made, um, to call us to the beauty of our bodies. Uh, yesterday I spoke about uh, the, the law of first mention, and, and most of you will know that the, the first time uh, Scripture speaks about the spirit on a person, um, it's on the artist Bezalel and, and, and his crew. And uh, they were given all this material to beautify the, um, the tabernacle. And um, you see that in the Old Testament, these artists were called to do work on the temple, the place of, of God's habitation. Um, 
you know, the, the, the first temple, you know, after the original tabernacle and tent, it was lined with gold and, and silver and all kinds of amazingly artistic works inside the temple. It, it was a, a, a beautification um, of the temple. And today, we obviously, we don't think of the temple in that way, do we? Um, scripture says that the, the earth is my footstool, and the, you know, the, the, the heavens, what does the scripture say? It says, um, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where is my resting place? Um, there is this, this concept of what does it mean as an artist to beautify the habitation of God? Um, is, it, is it about, is it, is it about uh, paintings? Is it about beautiful artworks? Um, I, 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 I submit that there is something that, that artists have in which they are able to pull out the beauty in the things that God created, the things that God cares, cares about. If, 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 if heaven is, is his, his throne, what does the scripture say? I must look at, look at it again. Um, if, if heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool, um, what does it look like for us to be able to bring out the beauty and the glory of those things Pointing to the wonder of God. Pointing to the, uh, helping the world see a God that is dramatically profound and beautiful and glorious. How, how, how do we take the normal things of, of every day and bring out the wonder and the glory of those things so that people can see them? So that people can see God and say, okay, that is God. But then... More than that, what does it look like for the true church, the habitation of God, the, 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 the temple, the church, the body of Christ? What does it look like for that to be beautified? Um, part of what I talked about yesterday is that um, artists have the ability to, to bring out the beauty in things, um, but as the body... Um, where do we live? We, we live in our homes. We live at work. We, we, we have relationships. I say at work, at home, at play. Um, how is it that we can live our natural lives so that they are beautiful? What role do, do we as artists have in helping um, the body of Christ live lives that glorify God? Um, uh, how do we go about doing that? So, part of, part of our worship to God is, is what we do, as I said, in our, in our family, at work, in, in our relationships, our fun times. Um, how do we draw out worship to God in those, in those contexts? Now, because artists are, are already able to take... Um, just normal everyday things and show the beauty in them. And I love what, what, what Aidy did today, how she, how she described her world and, 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 and helped us see the, the beauty in it. Um, how do we do, take that from the artist's perspective and help normal people apply it in their, in their own lives? Um, You'll be interested to know that one of the first things it, it, it says about artists is that they are to do and to teach. That, that scripture in um, Exodus 35, when it talks about Bezalel, it says that they are to work with all these, these beautiful things and work in gold and silver. And then it says, and I've given them the ability to teach others. So it's this... Uh, aspect of doing and teaching. We're, we're good at the, at the doing part, but how about the, the teaching part? What, is, what does it look like to, to impart what we are able to do to others? 
and not just to other artists in, 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 uh, in the sense that we are artists here in this room, but uh, uh, one of the things I talk about is that because everybody can create, um, everybody needs to learn how to work their craft in whatever sphere of society that they're looking, that they're looking at. And, and because artists are so good at what they're doing, they have this capacity and responsibility to teach everyday people. Um, one of the things that, that AD says is um, adding, subtracting, layering, creating a sense of fragility. How does the person who's trying to come up with an engineering solution, how do they apply those principles? Adding, subtracting, layering. How, how, because to create something, you need that aspect. And who else but artists to help um, teach those things to people in whatever it is, engineering, gardening, or, you know, whatever the discipline is. There's this aspect of teaching that is so important. And, and we see it in, in scripture. Um, the, the other part uh, of the question, just transitioning a little bit, is you know, comment on some of the potential disconnects and problems between an artist and the church and how these might be resolved. I don't know how they might be resolved, but I can tell you what the problems are. <laughs> that's, that's a joke. Um, uh, St. Augustine uh, this quote came up yesterday he says uh, God gave us two texts scripture and creation two texts scripture and creation and if they seem to contradict it's because we haven't understood one of them yet um, I think there's this disconnect in the church with um, creation as a, as a holy text. So we're, we're very comfortable as pastors in the church going through scripture and teaching all the wonderful things in scripture. Um, but anything outside of that um, creation, uh, the world out there, we're, we're not familiar with that. And of course, that is the realm that artists live in. Um, but creation shows us God, doesn't it? And um, there's this whole half of living life that human beings have that the church isn't very good at addressing. And that's where, that's where creators and artists live. So, so there's, there's that disconnect, um, the sacred-secular divide. Um, the other thing is that um, church is not... How do I put it? Um, so when I was leading a church, a lot of what we did was celebrate all the new leaders that we were developing, all the new small groups that we're doing, all the children's church workers and all our church programs. And, and those are the things that were celebrated in the church. If you're a really good children's church worker, man, let's, let them stand up and say, you know, uh, you know, Anu is so good at this. We celebrate him, um, or we celebrate all our small group leaders. Um, the thing is, you get what you celebrate. You, yeah, yeah. So, so, so you get what you celebrate. Um, I, I think that there is a disconnect because often um, church life is just one, one aspect of, a, of an individual's life. I mean, they're, they're going to go home and they've got kids with snotty noses and they've got bosses that don't want to listen to them and they've got, you know, boyfriends who are breaking up with them. And, and um, then there's, you know, Sunday and, and maybe Thursday cell group and, the, you know, church programs. Uh, but that's still just a small part of, of everyday life. Everybody else has got so much else to do and engaging the world and... and, and we are not good at celebrating life and everyday life within the church context. Um, and, and so, obviously, we don't feel valued 
because it's not celebrated within the church context. Um, and, and so this disconnect, this distance be- begins to grow, especially with, with artists who are um, dealing with real things out there. Um, I, th- I think one of, one of the things that we need to do is create programs within the church context that do celebrate those things um, so that people feel like this is part of the church. One of the things uh, I used to do, um, that beautiful thing, I used to run that beautiful thing in Cape Town. I was the leader of the church and we had this program that was specifically for artists, uh, and not just Christian artists, anybody. It was almost like an outreach program. We wanted a safe space for artists to come and do their thing, tell their story, and it was connected to the church. And so people, people didn't feel like they had to go outside to express themselves, which is, which is part of the disconnect. And in fact, a lot of non-Christian artists would come in and say, oh, so what church are you a part of? You know, can I come on Sunday? And, you know, some people did come. Um, But I think that's one of the ways we can help artists have official programs that are not just, um, okay, I know you're doing it. And, you know, just I'll I'll, I'll give you my blessing. Just don't talk about us as, uh, you know, as the pastor. Don't talk about, uh, you know, the church while you're doing it. But I'm glad you're doing it. Well done. Um, Um. but to recognize, celebrate, talk about these things within the church, encourage people to go. Um, The other thing that I think we can help with is, uh, and I think I'll just finish with this, is pastors in the creative space. Um, Some of us, I mean, probably the reason that you're here is that you are creative and you're you're a pastor. there is a mandate and, and a call to begin to deliberately engage our colleagues and our friends around arts and the church. And it's, it's, it's like yeast, it starts small and, and it begins to grow, but we have to start somewhere. Um, there is that responsibility that we have. Um, there may be people here, and you know, hey, I can speak to my pastor and, and invite so-and-so to come. Um, and begin to talk about these things within the church context. Leave it there. Okay. Right. Thank you very much, um, Manla. I have lots of things going through my mind that I'd like to say, but I, I mean, we're going to move over to Stefan on that side. So, Mandela has begun to address the question, which is really this relationship between sort of how do we manage this kind of thing. Now, you're on the team uh, of a church. I think that I've attended and that, that, that I know you guys take great care with everything aesthetically. It's a, it really is quite a, an amazing experience. There's not a lot you can do with a school hall, but you guys do really well with that. And, um, and so you're on the staff of a church with that kind of function and role. So the question really to you is, you know, how are you experiencing that? How are you personally finding that? What are some of the practical ways and what, what that might look like to address this kind of vacuum, this crisis actually for people? And anything else you'd like to just add or, or, or comment on what the others have said so far? Yeah. Thanks, James. Um, how, how would you um, word the crisis specifically? I think the crisis often with artists is a is is kind of the it it's it's often the crisis of of being part of the kingdom but but in the midst of religiosity so you you feel like you are someone who actually embodies something of a calling of Christ in your life but the system with which you're in is one that disenfranchises you so often what binds people together at a conference like this and I hate to say it is that the, the, often there are people who feel somewhat marginalized and they come here and they find their tribe I think that's a common experience. I think we've grown in that maturity and in our involvement in the church, but often there's a sense in which the artists feel that they really don't, they, they, you, they're purely utilitarian in relation to both the, the expression of worship from every, in every aspect of the worship. I don't know if I articulate, does that help? Yeah, that helps job? a lot, thanks. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think firstly, sitting here um, 
I'm suffering a serious case of imposter syndrome. Um, <laughs> as, um, I'm being called a pastor, but I don't have the I don't have the credentials for it. But uh, that's why I said earlier, I've got the years. Um, and um, I've I've been very privileged to to start you know to serve in church since I was a teenager, and um, I was about 14 years old when I got involved in in a worship team at a local church, a Methodist church in George, and. I mean, that just really sucked me in, um, and, it, and it became my life very quickly. Um, and here I am about 25 years later, and um, <clears throat> still very much part of it. And it's, it's such a beautiful, frustrating space. That, um, that uh, poem that, that A.D. read earlier, that, that really resonated deeply with me. Um, there's always this kind of push and pull between... Um, my my uh, deep love and um, kind of you know, frustration, as I said, of of the church. But what a lovely space to um, you know to be able to to serve in. Um, so I was having a conversation with with Michelisa earlier this morning, and um, I was reminded of um, this beautiful framework that um, Gideon Strauss, Eddie also referred to him earlier in a video. Um, that I learned from him, and it, it really helped me a lot in terms of, at least for myself, in terms of this almost, um, uh, I don't know what the word was that you used, but this kind of crisis that, that we live in, and the crisis for me as a musician, um, um, often being in front of people, so I think that's a bit different. Uh, most visual artists, your art is, is being displayed, whereas as a musician, often you're being displayed. Um, in a in a way, and within the church context, there's always this um, kind of tension between when is it worship and when is it show. Um, that's something that that's something that I've I've really I've honestly struggled with for for a long time. It's like kind of where is that that thin line, and when am I crossing that border um, to a point where it's all about me and it's not about God and but on the other hand, we want to do things excellently, and we want to do things uh, beautifully, and we want to really, I think, to, to what you, you refer to, Mandela, as the artist that, you know, was called to do things in a very specific, beautiful way. So there's also that part of me who wants to do things really well. Um, and um, what he spoke of, and, and it's probably not news to you, but he spoke of this um, thing called the hospitality framework. And... <clears throat> what he said was, if you um, follow the creation narrative, there's, there's a lot of beautiful um, kind of r repetitive um, kind of ideas within, within the creation story. But one of them that comes out pretty quickly is this idea that God um, creates a space, and then once he's created that space, he then fills it with life. And that happens a couple of times. Uh, throughout that story, and ultimately where it's um, it's filled with with us, with um, with with humans, and um, actually filled with community. That's that's what happens in in the end of that story. And the act of creating a space that is able to contain life is actually you are making a space, and you're making that space hospitable. Um. And that's where this idea of hospitality comes from, is that if we are hospitable in our, um, whatever we do, if we create spaces that's able to contain life, where God is able to put life into that space, then we are co-creators with God in this, in this ongoing um, place of creation. And, and that really, when, when I... When I heard that, and that kind of concept started kind of percolating in me, that immediately let me, it helped me relax as to this thing of when is it show and when is it worship. The question is, am I creating hospitable spaces? That's, that, as an artist, that's the only question that I'm busy with as a Christian artist. Is what I'm doing um, adding to God's creation in the sense that it is enabling life to exist, or is it doing something else, whatever that might be. Um, and so it's no, it's, to me, it's no more that kind of um, uh, dichotomy of, 
of show versus worship, it's, it's this, this beautiful invitation to become a co-creator. Um, and the, the church is, is, a, is a really fascinating, um, unique place and, and to be able to do that. And, and when I say church, I actually specifically refer to the, to the worship service space. I know church is a lot more than that, but that weekly, um, in my world, often relentless um, kind of creative space, um, there's, there's, there's always this um, temptation to be novel. There's a temptation to always bring in something new and bring in something, you know, that's going to wow people or that's going to be exciting. Um, and I've, I've learned um, through the last couple of years to really kind of, even though there's always some pressure maybe from a, uh, you know, from a preacher or someone to like, no, we need to do something new. It's like, I'm just going to, I hear you. <laughs> but, but no, um, we're going to, we're going to stick, we're going to stick to what, um, to what in a sense we know works. So uh, we've heard the word liturgy being used once or twice. Um, and some people might call me a worship pastor. Some people might call me um, the guy with the guitar, um, but I see myself as a liturgist. So a liturgist is basically the person that, or I'm the curator of whatever, whatever happens in that hour or two hours of, of time spent together purposefully, specifically um, in that communal worship space. It's a very, very unique space that we find ourselves in, um, in, in our case, every Sunday morning. <clears throat> and the word liturgy is, is beautiful in that it actually means the work of the people. So liturgy isn't something that is, is just presented. It's something that is being taken part in. It's being um, collaborated. There's this there's collaboration in this. So that's the one thing is about being able to create spaces that is, that is open for people to, co to collaborate. Um, and the, the other concept is that um, there's a guy called Jamie Smith, or James Smith, who wrote a book called um, You Are What You Love. And that concept also really comes in play um, through our, our weekly services. And it's this, you, you are that which you spend your time on. You become that thing, and that becomes your, your desire. Whatever your desire is what you become. And what you desire is formed by what you do continuously. So I think it's not, not really a new thing, but um, I think for some reason we don't really believe that. We think that whatever I think is what I become, but that's not true. It's what I act on. It's what I, what I do. You, you mentioned we're embodied beings. You know, I'm not a brain on a stick. I'm, I'm this, whole, this whole human being. Um, so what I do with my body, what I do with my time, what I do with my um, uh, attention, that's going to shape me and that's going to form me towards becoming something. Uh, that's the, the Romans 12 idea. So um, uh, I like to think of church as, as, a, as a gymnasium in that sense. Um, and uh, there's a, another lovely book uh, called The Eternal Current by a guy called Aaron Nyquist. Um, I'll, uh, if, if you can get hold of that, it's, it's really worthwhile. And he uses this, this metaphor where he says, imagine you come into a space, um, you join a gym. Okay, so you've, you've, you've joined a gym, you come into that space. When you arrive, they call you into this room and there's a, there's a band playing U2 covers at the front for like uh, 20 minutes. And then there's a guy who walks up and he's, uh, welcome everyone. Um, it's so lovely to have you here. And this guy tells you all about, you know, what it is like to exercise and how you need to exercise and all the kind of theory behind it and what works and what doesn't work. And at the end of this talk, you feel like super like amped and excited and, at, and they're like, well, it's so good to see you guys. I hope you come again next week and, um, and then we'll continue this conversation and you walk out of there. And you can continue doing this for a year 
and you will still be the same. Like nothing physically, nothing will change about your body physically unless someone is going to go, okay, this is a treadmill, this is how it works, you need to do three reps of this and that. And someone actually takes your hand and shows you what to do. So um, to, to me, that's kind of the invitation of the church and of that kind of that weekly um, pursuit of the church is to actually be able to show people, but this is how you do it. And I think art has a very um, kind of crucial role in that process and starting off with creating, um, I don't want to necessarily use the word safe, but safe, brave, um, uh, hospitable spaces because that's going to allow people to to be able to kind of engage in this life-changing behavior rather than just receiving input um, on a weekly on a weekly basis excellent that was so good that uh, that language of, of gymnasium and training actually pops up in Paul's letter to Timothy so that's good okay I think we're gonna wrap it there that's fantastic. Won't, let's, let's give the panel a hand. Thanks.